Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Colonel Gerald Graham. I'm one of the uh, federal executive fellows here at the uh, at Brookings. Uh, on behalf of the other federal executive fellows, I'd like to thank Brookings for uh, putting on this event this morning, as well as for those who helped uh, bring this together. Also, I would like to thank the panelists and moderators that we'll have throughout the, today. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's symposium on the National Defense Strategy. On January 19th of this year, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis rolled out the unclassified summary of the National Defense Strategy. Secretary De Defense Mattis stated the NDS is an American strategy. This is the first National Defense Strategy in 10 years. The National Defense Strategy is designed to protect America's vital national interests and is inside the framework of the National Security Strategy, which was published in December of 2017. Secretary Mattis stated that America's military reclaims an era of strategic purpose. We will continue to prosecute the campaign against terrorists. But great power competition, not terrorism, is now the primary focus of the U.S. national security. The national defense strategy goes on to state that we're facing growing threats from revisionist powers like China and Russia. Rogue regimes like North Korea and Iran are destabilizing regions through their pursuit of nuclear weapons and sponsoring terrorism. The drive to develop technologies is relentless, expanding to more actors with lower barriers of entry and moving at accelerating rate speed. America's military has no preordained right to victory on the battlefield. So with that, the national defense strategy has three distinct lines of effort. First, rebuilding military readiness as we build a more lethal joint force. Second, strengthening alliances as we attract new partners. And third, reforming the department's business practices for greater performance and affordability. Hopefully today, as we go through, we'll be able to talk about some of the immediate consequences of the policy and how it affects other countries around the world. With that being said, thank you for coming out and taking time out of your day. And without further ado, I'll turn the stage over to our first moderator, Jung Pak, Senior Fellow, Foreign Policy Center for Asia, East Asia Policy and Studies here at Brookings. Thank you and welcome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful spring day, finally. Hope it'll last um, this time. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating this panel today of some of our distinguished speakers. I wanted to give you a quick introduction, um, and then we'll, we'll uh, roll into our discussion, uh, which I will moderate. Um, to my left um, is Colonel J.B. Vowell, who has served as an infantry officer in the U.S. Army for over 26 years. In that time, he has been stationed or deployed in Europe, the Pacific, the Middle East, and many posts across the U.S. He has three combat tours in Afghanistan and one in Iraq, uh, participating in both surge periods. Um, he is currently the executive officer to the Secretary of the Army. To his left is Colonel Jesse Friedel, is, who is the National Defense Fellow at CSIS down the street. Um, prior to CSIS, uh, Colonel Friedel was the Air and Sea Branch Chief in the Force Application Division at the Joint Chiefs of Staff J-8 at the Pentagon. Um, he has, um, is a command pilot with more than 2,500 flying hours, including over 400 combat hours. Um, he has flown in support of Operations Enduring Freedom, Northern Watch, Noble Eagle, and the Republic of Korea uh, Defense Obligations. To his left is Commander Kate Higgins-Bloom of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, who is a federal executive fellow here at Brookings. Uh, she has held a variety of leadership roles at the Coast Guard, uh, conducting missions ranging from search and rescue to counter narcotics to national defense. She has deployed throughout the Caribbean and Eastern Pacific to the Arabian Gulf in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and to numerous domestic responses, including Hurricane Katrina. Finally, last but not least, is Commander Daniel Straub, who is a senior military fellow at the Center for New American Security. Commander Straub joined the U.S. Navy in 1983 and has deployed to the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, the Mediterranean Sea, Adriatic Sea, South China Sea, and the Arabian Gulf, uh, among other places. Uh, he has taught at Boston University, where he received his master's degree, and he also has a PhD from the Naval Postgraduate School. Please welcome the panelists here today. So I wanted to, so thanks, Gerald, for um, 
for that brief synopsis of the national defense uh, strategy. Um, and the NDS um, lays out the current challenges to our national security, the role of the military and how to, how to meet those <clears throat> challenges, and lays out what our priorities are for spending. Um, and I'm so pleased to be having this conversation with, with, um, with our panelists here today. Right off the bat, the, the unclassified introduction of the NDS states that our competitive military advantage has been eroding. That's a powerful statement. Um, in addition to uh, what Gerald mentioned about the, how interstate conflict, um, strategic competition, not terrorism, is now our primary concern. And given the shift from counterinsurgency and terrorism toward the strategic competition, um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on how this shift in emphasis translates to your services um, from your perspective. What does the strategy look like in terms of how it's implemented and how it looks like, what it looks like on the ground or air or sea by that uh, for that matter? Um, so I, I want to start with um, JB, if you don't mind. Thanks, Joey. Um, it's good to be back. I was a fellow here a year and a half ago, so any place outside the Pentagon is a, is a worthy day. <laughs> uh, well, I'll try to stay away from terms and acronyms uh, as best we can, but to, specifically on the question for the Army, the National Defense Strategy is an acknowledgement uh, of strategic competition that's been brewing for a while. And the Army, as the service that does the, the land power uh, component of the Joint Force, uh, we've been doing counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, gotten very good at targeting and, and human uh, terrain network operations for about 17, 18 years. In the same time period, uh, some strategic and regional competitors have gotten better. While we were looking very focused as an army to working with the human dimension of conflict, uh, we were asleep at the switch in other dimensions. And that's when the gaps and seams were kind of filled in modernization and capabilities. With both China and Russia, they underwent a very aggressive modernization campaign for their forces. And right now, we talk about, and the National Defense Strategy alludes to this directly, we are behind in some of those capabilities. Long-range fires uh, in certain domains um, in land, air, space, maritime, uh, cyber, for example, there are niche capabilities we don't have or in a comparative advantage compared to strategic peers. That's a problem. That's a problem for us. So an analogy could be given in 2018 to 1973, the Arab Israeli War. For the Army, that was a wake-up call coming out of Southeast Asia and Vietnam. The use of AT missiles, tank-on-tank -tank warfare, the different capabilities in that conflict brought about what you see today with the Army's big five systems, the tanks, the Bradleys, the missiles, the multiple launch rocket systems, the helicopters that we still have today, the legacy systems. But with that came a doctrine and an acknowledgement that the environment had changed to fight the Soviets at the time. Fast forward to 2018. We have somewhat of a similar situation where there are capabilities with Russia and China, specifically in the NDS, uh, that are not peer to us, they, they outpace us. And it's not necessarily that we are behind, we just need to get forward of that. And that's an opportunity for the Army. Uh, and the NDS acknowledges that gap, those seams, and the capabilities that we need to respond to. And so the Secretary of the Army right now, I can tell you, is very focused on updating the readiness, updating modernization, and the reform of the department that will meet and nest with the specific guidance from uh, from uh, Secretary Mattis and the National Defense Strategy. Great. Thank you. Jesse, what do you think from the Air Force perspective? So I look at this as we begin uh, reading the NDS, the unclassified version. The first line talks about how we need combat credible forces so that we can deter and then protect our nation. And the deter piece is the piece that I think the Air Force uh, would prefer to focus on. Realizing that uh, everything I say is pretty much my perspective, but uh, as we, everyone probably heard, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force and Chief of Staff of the Air Force uh, defend or talked about the posture for the fiscal year 19 uh, uh, budget proposal two days ago. The biggest things that uh, we look at from the Air Force perspective is we didn't want to sit there and wait for uh, our potential competitors uh, as they 
drove that competition up and we looked at the capabilities that we're, they were developing and we set idle. It's not that we're shifting away from the uh, operations that are currently occurring, but if you look at our major uh, defense acquisition programs, you can see that we assured that we were moving forward with our capabilities. So the five big uh, priorities that the Secretary of the Air Force came into office uh, last year with were really aligned with the national defense strategy because the vision that Mattis uh, put out at the beginning is the way the Air Force continued uh, over this, this last year as we developed our fiscal year 19 budget. The big things, uh, as we're talking about trying to uh, assure that we have that readiness uh, that we need, uh, that we are uh, effectively getting a, um, a adequate modernization of our forces, that we are driving the innovation to assure that uh, we are thinking outside the container uh, and able to uh, utilize industry, utilize academia in order to get the best bang for the buck uh, for every dollar that uh, we have available to spend on our capabilities, uh, that we develop our leadership uh, to make be exceptional leadership, and then to also look at uh, strengthening the alliances. And as we uh, continue through our major defense acquisition programs, the big things that come screaming out as we talk about uh, the competition of uh, equipment and capabilities, uh, we're talking about the B-21, the F-35, uh, that we can't wait until we already have a gap to try to eliminate or minimize that gap. So the Air Force has been forward-looking so that as gaps come up, we already have those capabilities because we predicted what those gaps might be in the future. Thank you. Kate, all right. uh, thank you so much for having me, and thank you to everybody for making time to come to Brookings this morning. We appreciate having you. Uh, from the Coast Guard perspective, the NDS and the NSS really reflect what a lot of us had been seeing out on the water, which was rising competition, particularly in the Pacific. And to have that really enshrined in a strategic document is incredibly helpful for us as we look at how we can recapitalize our fleet to be the most competitive uh, Coast Guard that you could possibly have. Um, in particular, the emphasis on lethality in the NDS is something that I think um, the Coast Guard had started to move away from um, over the past few decades as we focused on DHS and our mission. So this is a real opportunity to look at our assets as we build them, uh, to make sure we're building something that's truly interoperable and capable of meeting the needs of one of our statutory missions, which is to operate as part of the Department of Defense as an armed service. Um, and this ranges not only from recapping our current cutters, the white hulled ships that you see uh, in our recruiting material, but also icebreakers. Uh, they take a long time to design and a long time to build. And that the emphasis on innovation and looking over the horizon is something that we take uh, to heart. Um, the one component that we are going to find the most challenging really is capacity. While being an armed service is part of our identity and we are at all times military. We also have 11 statutory missions that include a lot of things that are outside the, the purview of the Department of Defense. Uh, a perfect example is last week, Admiral Schultz, our nominee for Commandant, had his confirmation hearing. And the junior senator from Alaska very rightly questioned him about our deployments of cutters to the South China Sea in support of PACOM. Um, and how that's going to impact our ability to protect the multi-billion dollar fisheries in Alaska, uh, conduct counter-narcotics and immigration enforcement on the southern border, and foster a lot of the partnerships we have that are keeping the Western Hemisphere safe and secure, and really allowing us to focus as a country on some of these other threats in the Pacific and in the CENTCOM AOR and um, in Europe. Um, but again, it all comes back to capacity. Uh, we have a very limited capacity to, to meet these missions. So our biggest question is how much of the NDS are we going to be able to support um, relative to our, uh, our role in DHS? Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, one thing I noticed, back in 2007, I was on USS Shoop, a guided missile destroyer. We were down in San Diego, and we were the host ship uh, for the Chinese warships that were coming in. 
Now, the one thing that I noticed when those Chinese warships came into San Diego was that they had an inordinate amount of uh, observation equipment, cameras, microphones, and, and numerous other devices that I didn't even know what they were, up on the masts of those ships as they came in. Now, they didn't really seem to be observing watertight integrity quite well because they had so many cables running everywhere up through scuttles and et cetera. But what this was to me was this is an indicator that they were starting to embark on something that we weren't, we weren't working on. And that is sort of new systems on maybe older ships. What we were doing in the Navy at the time was continuing to maintain those old systems, which were very capable, but they were also old. And so what I saw was is I saw us using these old systems and continuing to use these old systems. And what I think the, the NDS is going to do is refocus on not only revitalizing those old systems, but also moving us into the direction where we can get new systems. A lot of money uh, is being allocated toward research and development. A lot of money is being allocated toward uh, investment in these new systems. And I think by the same token, we need to also invest in using those ships that we have, uh, not only for the missions they were originally intended, uh, but also figuring out new ways to use them. So what am I talking about? Well, I had command of a, a frigate, a guided missile frigate, USS Ingraham. Uh, mostly old, old systems, older ship, and the moment that it lost its missile, uh, its missile capability, its anti-ship missile, excuse me, its uh, surface-to-air missile capability, it was no longer a carrier strike group asset. That ship was now relegated to do counter-drug missions, uh, uh, help out uh, all over the world in different HADR, uh, maybe it was doing counter-piracy, but it was independent steaming for the most part, or working with the Coast Guard, those sorts of missions. It no longer was a carrier strike group asset. So we moved into, uh, I think, getting rid of all the frigates in 2015. I then had the opportunity to command a LCS, a literal combat ship. And the problem there was most of the, well, let's just say, let's just say it. The three mission modules that were supposed to support that ship, the anti-submarine warfare mission module, the countermine, uh, mine countermeasures war, uh, mission module, and finally the anti uh, excuse me, the anti-surface warfare mission module, were not ready for prime time by the time those ships were being commissioned. It took 10 years uh, before the first mission module was really sort of starting to up and get up and running. I don't think we need to do that either. We don't need to get so in ahead of ourselves on the tech that the ships aren't ready to, to go out there. So I think we're moving in the right direction with the FFGX, and the FFGX is going to, to do what it needs to do. And that is aligned with the money that the Navy is uh, getting and with, which is in the budget for us to build the ships we need. We're moving toward the 355 ship Navy. By next year, we are looking at 299 ships, uh, 10 new ships and submarines. Uh, additionally, an, an additional 120 uh, aviation uh, rotary and fixed wing as well as uh, unmanned aviation systems. Uh, we're really getting to where we need to be. But Back to what I said about our older ships. We still need to modernize those ships, and I think we're doing that with the cruisers. But to move into this LCS thing, which has gotten a lot of, uh, gotten a lot of uh, negative press, let's say, and, and negative uh, 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 talk. Uh, I've heard a lot of it as a former LCS CO. I would argue that we can use these LCSs for more than just those three mission areas. I would argue that I, we need to start looking at the LCSs as maybe they're going to be drone uh, transport platforms, unmanned systems transport platforms. Maybe they can act as, uh, a in a sense, buses or trucks to carry these things, be supported by the uh, what are called the expeditionary, expeditionary fast transports. We can use these LCSs in other littorals, like the Balkans. What I'm getting at here is, is uh, a lot of focus has been made on the fact that they are uh, undergunned uh, and they, they are under-armored. Well, maybe let's use the advantages that they do have for those missions that we're currently filling with uh, very highly capable destroyers, uh, cruisers, etc. cetera. Um, the LCSs can do the freedom of navigation operations, those different missions. Um, as far as LCS, uh, excuse me, as far as the NDS goes, I believe from the Navy perspective, I mean, it is exactly what we need right now. It's looking at capability increases, capacity increases, and then it's answering everything that the CNO wants, which is the bigger fleet, better fleet, uh, networked fleet. And that's an area we need to put a lot of work, I believe, 
that interoperability piece. And finally, at agility, sort of the dynamic employment of those forces, not being everywhere at all times, but being where we need to be when we need to be there. And how we're gonna do that is through, I think, those integra the integration of those sensors and through much better uh, coordination uh, in, our joint, in our joint forces. Thank you. Uh, um, you know, national security documents generally are not happy reads, um, but I did really enjoy this one line, which is, um, more than any other nation, America can expand the competitive space seizing the initiative to challenge our competitors where we possess advantages and they lack strength. From your perspective, what do you see are our competitors' advantages or disadvantages? And what are the ways that we can, or your services can expand our competitive space? So um, let, why don't we start with Kate? Do you want, do you want to start, jump, okay. start us off? Great. Um, so as far as our competitive advantages as a service for the Coast Guard, uh, this sort of transcends the NDS, but it certainly serves that. Uh, first and foremost is our, our people um, and really their flexibility to operate up and down the full spectrum, not just of conflict, but of competition. So uh, because of our unique authorities to conduct law enforcement and the role we play regulating maritime commerce, not just here, but as part of an international community, uh, we're able to engage in a competitive space and then move quickly into a national defense mission. And that's almost custom built for some of the gray zone issues that we've seen emerging in the Pacific. Um, and that's something that you cannot buy overnight or off the shelf. So it's, it's innate and we really don't see it um, in any of our strategic competitors. That culture of independence and flexibility and an ability to uh, deal with complexity and adapt to a new mission that might change. Whether it's, uh, you know, you go out on what you believe to be a search and rescue case uh, that turns out to be um, human trafficking or even something more nefarious. So that would be first and foremost. Uh, as an extension of that is it has built a reputation that uh, is global as the premier maritime service and gives us the opportunity to partner and really build capacity um, across the world. We have uh, Coast Guard personnel currently in Vietnam, working in the Africa Partner Station, uh, building capacity where we need it so that these regions can essentially become safe neighborhoods, uh, perhaps a little more resistant to the revisionist activities of China in particular. Um, so those are really our strengths um, that I would say serve the NDS. Dan, can I sure. move to you? <clears throat> I, think, I think we need to, uh, for the competition piece, I mean, we're ret this return to great power competition is, is uh, the, one of the essential elements of this document. Uh, how are we going to do that? Well, we need to invest, I believe, we need to invest heavily in AI. We need to invest heavily in these unmanned systems, uh, cyber, space domain. We need to work on the things that our great power competitors are working on. And that doesn't mean that we need to, to uh, match them uh, uh, thing for thing. Uh, it doesn't mean that we need to copy their technologies. In my opinion, what we need to do is, is we need to be innovative, find what their weaknesses are, identify theirs, and build on our strengths. Um, and, and so how are we going to do that? And again, it's going to have to be through investment. It's going to have to be through uh, working very closely with, uh, with uh, corporations and those uh, cutting edge companies that are working on, on these cutting edge technologies. And then, and then finally, uh, maybe a more nimble acquisition system one maybe that doesn't necessarily look at an item that we're going to purchase that something needs to last 10 or 30 years, but maybe an item that we're going to purchase that's going to work for now to give us that advantage, and maybe we purchase another and different system uh, later. How that's going to happen, again, maybe, we, maybe it happens through a, 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 an acquisition system that, that uh, bypasses some of the existing methods of, of, uh, of uh, uh, obtaining the newest stuff. And, uh, and I, I, would, I would say that the NDS talks about it a little bit, and I know that the uh, CNO has mentioned that we need to look at, at ways of acquiring those systems faster. Thank you. JB, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think uh, that's a very good question. Strategically, um, why, let's just say Russia and China is, uh, is probably better postured currently in the future is because they can work those gaps and seams, that the era of competition below conflict 
in all those domains. Uh, if you go to Eastern Europe right now, I was in Poland a couple months ago, and when the Moskorovka or information operations from Russia is affecting the Baltics so much that stories get planted where U.S. soldiers were raping some of the civilian girls there in Estonia, and people are trying to determine fact or fiction. That has an operational effect yeah. on the ground. We don't act that way. But the full gamut of capabilities and domains, uh, at least the operational level, and, and soon to be strategic in nature, are advantages. The, the story of, uh, the, of boiling the frog, I think, is what's been going on with both Russia and China right now. If you look at the South China Sea, Spratly Islands, over time developing and integrating themselves in small little atolls and, and militarizing them. Uh, like it's going out of style, so it becomes a very problematic venture in the future for an anti-access air denial problem. Mm -hmm. You look at what Russia did in Ukraine and what they've done uh, in other places, they were slowly able to just foment opposition and, and work with people inside, went into Crimea, went into the Donbass, and it's a fait accompli very quickly. And now you have a frozen conflict in Ukraine, so Ukraine can never be a NATO member by our own you know, definitions very good at working underneath the spectrum of conflict and obfuscating the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. So for the United States Army, what we have to do is to be able to compete the narrative in a lot of those information operations spaces, I would say. Not only the lethality portion of combat on land, we have to be very good at that. That's not going to go away. But the character of warfare is changing. The national defense strategy acknowledges that the character of warfare, not the nature itself, but the character is abruptly changing now in the future. So the Army has developed in the last 18 months or so this multi-domain battle concept that discusses and articulates the different domains that are out there with all the joint services and, and beyond to where we are much more competitive. We can deter, we can defeat, uh, degrade, diffuse, deny in those domains. The Army has particular strengths in all of those areas. A multi-domain battle is an opportunity for the Army to fire anti-ship missiles from land systems in support of the Navy, for example, in the South China Seas. There, there are operations beyond joint that the Army can provide in support of maritime, air, and land operations. So that's, that's where the Army has an advantage in, in our people, our leadership, and our capabilities to tackle this problem now and in the future. Mm, thank you. Jesse. So from the Air Force perspective, uh, in my opinion, as we talk about the advantages of competition, given the equipment that we have, is we're focusing on the eroding piece. Um, we don't feel like we are sideways or behind what our competitors have. But the two focus areas that really were uh, proposed in the fiscal year 19 budget that was a bold move or shift from what we were initially planning was accelerating the uh, defensive space capability and also the multi-domain operations uh, as we see ourselves as the responsibility of the command and control piece. So our chief staff of the Air Force, one of his big rocks or uh, focus areas is that multi-domain command and control. And to be able to get out there to assure that all of our space, air, and hopefully uh, ground, uh, manned, unmanned, are completely connected to get that common operating picture to everyone out in the joint uh, arena and additionally out into the coalition, whatever coalition we might be working with with any future conflicts. So strengthening our allies uh, and our partners to also have that key piece of information so that they can do what they are able to with the technology or capabilities they have at their fingertips to affect the battlefield. The other piece that I think that we, because of the budget rollbacks, uh, the amount of money we had available, and uh, a little bit uh, that we can't support internally anymore in creating things that we need, uh, is we increased our RDT&E uh, proposed in fiscal year 19 by 19% uh, to focus on getting back into the labs, getting industry and academia completely connected, looking out there with uh, what is in the uh, civilian sector and seeing how we can modify that or take it commercial off the shelf and influence our overall uh, capability in the joint force so that we can more quickly have something that continues to keep us at an advantage, uh, competitive advantage versus uh, those great power 
uh, competitors that we're discussing about. Great, thank you. Um, all of you have mentioned um, in some way or other um, the workforce um, and training as, as, a, as a critical component of um, how we prepare and, and increase that competitive space. Um, Dan, I know you've written about this. Do you, would you like to talk about how um, you know, the NDS is focused on agility, education, and training, um, and talent management, and, and how we can improve in that, in that space? Uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief so everyone gets a chance to, to talk, but um, um, when I joined in 1983, the, uh, the, the slogan for the Navy was, uh, it's not just a job, it's an adventure. Well, I'll say that the talent piece has become more and more difficult. Guys like me got out of high school, joined the Navy, uh, and, and it, was, it was a fairly easy process. I needed a high school diploma, but not everyone did. Uh, there were guys uh, that in the, in, on my first ship that had said that they had, uh, it was either jail or the military for them. And so that was then. This is now. The, at least from my perspective, the sailors we're bringing into the Navy now are highly educated, highly capable, very easily trained uh, uh, sailors. But that competition is very fierce. Uh, the, the, just the thought of the adventure piece is not necessarily enough. Uh, they need to know that they're going to have a mission, a job, a role, and they're going to be counted on. And so we have to, I think we have to fight for that talent. Now, I know that the Navy is putting, uh, and I got the number here, an additional $1.5 billion into uh, personnel. And we are looking to gain 7,500 more uh, Navy people. Right now we have a, a force of about 328,000 and uh, we're looking to move to 335,000 uh, next year. That's a big increase. But again, uh, I think I heard recently only 26% of the uh, eligible uh, uh, people in America or, or people in America are eligible to join the military. That 26% is also going to be looking to go to colleges and universities and into the workforce. They're not necessarily jumping to join, at the, join the military. So we have a big job there uh, and working on that piece. But I will say, uh, I, I have to reinforce, the, the sailors that are in the Navy today are the best that I've seen. I've been in for 34 years, and I've been at all, the level, all levels, and they are the best sailors that I've seen. They're smart. They're capable, they're able to do the jobs, but we have to keep getting those sailors so that they can not only learn these new systems, but also learn how to repair uh, and work on our older systems and then lead and manage uh, in the Navy. Others want to <coughs> jump in with anything? Absolutely. Uh, this last year was actually uh, a focus area of mine on optimized air crew retention. So I wrote a research paper on it, did uh, some crowdsourcing uh, pulses, throughout our Air Force on our air crew. Uh, everyone's probably aware that we have a, a pilot crisis. Uh, we are down about 2,000 pilots, which is about 10% of our overall uh, pilot force. And uh, what uh, Dan alluded to is part of that challenge of being able to keep our talent. But additionally, as you roll that back, from my view, is there's a couple of root causes that got us to where we're at right now. And the one root cause uh, is that we got too small. And we're asking our, from my perspective, uh, airmen or our overall troops to do more than we've ever asked them to do. Uh, for the air crew's perspective, uh, given a lot of the feedback from our air crew, is they're doing two jobs, and each job is a full-time job. And in fact, it's kind of been a little bit of a twist, per, uh, perception that their job at their desk doing additional duties has become their primary job and they just, the nation expects them to go do their air job where that is the biggest risk for them as they go into combat and they wanna be more proficient at that. And most air crew enter the Air Force becoming air crew and they wanna be air crew. They don't want to be out there doing the additional duties. So there's a lot of effort within the Air Force to uh, try to right size that. First one, obviously, being in strength, increasing that in strength so that we get more support personnel, we get more maintainers, uh, and then we get a, a few more uh, in the officer corps uh, pilots so that we have some more retention numbers to be able to uh, battle against. Uh, the second uh, thing that is the root cause, in my opinion, is our ops tempo. Uh, we've asked 
uh, our airmen to be gone away from their families, uh, not just every once in a while, but continually, uh, year after year. And you can only ask your troops to do so much to be away from their family. Uh, there are opportunities in the uh, workforce that are willing to take these critical skill sets that uh, especially the, the immediate pilots get, but all air crew. And I'm not even focusing on air crew because all of these lessons or recommendations can fold into our cyber force, our intel force, all the way down because uh, the training that we get in the service uh, is very marketable out there in the civilian sector up to the point of uh, cliche in the realms of we're the training force for the civilian sector. Uh, our airlines are taking our pilots uh, and they're all the way down to taking uh, uh, helicopter pilots who have no uh, jet time uh, and training them to have jet time because we're so low, uh, not just even across the nation, across the world. So this critical skill set uh, is marketable and the work-life balance or quality of life versus the quality of service, all those things have kind of became out of balance uh, that it's tough to, to go home to mom and say, I'm going to be gone another six months uh, when they've served their nation uh, and uh, just don't want to go through that battle rhythm through the rest of their life. Uh, they've served honorably, so there is no... Uh, challenge to them to try to stay more, but we need to make sure that we build an environment that is able to retain them a longer period of time. So we have over 60 initiatives out there to uh, increase our uh, quality of life, work-life balance, and quality of service, all the way from uh, trying to manage our choices or options that the millennials want to have so that they feel like they're in more control uh, of what they want to do, to looking at having a technical force uh, and not everyone having to uh, go up the pyramid, going to schools, going to staffs, but actually being technical in an aviation job through uh, the rest or their whole career. Uh, that's being looked at. Uh, all the way uh, down to looking at uh, where we have our bases and assuring that we have opportunities for our families, that we're not putting our kids uh, in school systems that uh, are at the lower end of our nation's school systems, that we have opportunities for our spouses so that they can be employed crossing the borders from state to state because uh, they have a vote when we decide that we want to stay in. Uh, we, we also have some value in the fact that the purpose, the reason why we initially came in is the purpose to help uh, our nation and defending our nation, and we take pride in that but we're, we're not willing to lose our families over that. So uh, we're trying to right-size that, uh, working with Congress uh, and uh, academia and industry to assure that we have those opportunities to make it easier for our families to transition as we move so often. And we're taking a look at, do we need to be moving so often too? Uh, so that we have a more of a stability uh, for our families and we have uh, options or choices uh, that our, that our uh, troops have readily available so that they feel like they have more control. Right. Do you have any questions? Just a quick update. Um, uh, for the Army's perspective, if you ask the Secretary of the Army, this is one of the most important parts about the National Defense Strategy, talent management. That's a great buzzword. What he's talking about is how do I take each one of us, look at our knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors like an HR professional would, and look at the broadening experience, broadening assignments, and put him or her in the right job at the right time at the right place. That's a hard, hard science. It always has been. We're trying to transition from that industrial age production of mass quality and quantity of officers and senior enlisted into a qualitative environment where we really look at the individual. And everything that my colleague just mentioned about the family and the other focus factors are all part of that discussion to include input from the soldier, the officer. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that is going to be part and parcel to, to the, the future battlefield where it's going to be up close, personal, brutal, lethally rapid and fast. We have to put the best people in all parts of combat arms, sustainment functions, whatever, to be able to think and act faster than the enemy. That's going to require a different approach to managing our people, the, the key element to what the, uh, the Army provides. Thank you. Um, if I could just, I mean, if I say our strength is our people, I have to say something. <laughs>
but I just strongly associate myself with everything uh, that the rest of the panel has said. But you know, the rubber's really gonna hit the road soon with the blended retirement system. We're gonna start to see folks who at the 10 year mark may have considered staying in, who now have the option of leaving with a retirement account. Um, personally, I think it's, it's a phenomenal upgrade and it's actually the right thing to do by our folks, but it is really gonna put the onus on us to create services that people want to stay in. And part of that is gonna be programs like this. We're all fellows here. Our services have invested in us um, to really build the technical skills of our folks, not just in cyber, but in engineering. Um, the Coast Guard has a big regulatory role. Um, and so things like energy science, ship design, um, where industry is and sometimes generations ahead of us, uh, we need a way to continue to upgrade their skills because um, training money is often the first thing to go. Uh, so really looking at that as part of our strategic advantage uh, and our workforce development. Thank you. I have many more questions, but I wanted to give the audience a chance to um, ask your <coughs> questions. Um, so we'll take two questions at a time, and then um, we'll throw those at the panel. So raise your hand, and um, I would ask you to introduce yourself um, and keep your questions very brief. We answered everything. Awesome. <laughs> we have a question up here. 45 minutes. Hi there. I'm Marina Fazel, an Afghan-American journalist. Uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. The question is about, uh, you've all touched on allies uh, as part of your future strategy better defining, and obviously the focus of this talk is about the shift to competitive strategies rather than security-oriented in the post-9-11 <clears throat> atmosphere that has continued to this day. Uh, but you see, the Cold War um, is what was in the recesses of what led to what eventually percolated to be the causes of a 9-11 and uh, though the Afghan war might be considered to be going more successfully, um, last year there were more bombs dropped in Afghanistan. There were more casualties in Afghanistan um, than ever before. So on the one hand, it seems that this has all along been about competition, and it continues to be about competition. And yet this is the only planet that we know that we have to share whether or our fancies shift from one decade to the next. So who are your future allies as you shift to your next stage of being more competitive with one another? Who are the people that you will... What are, can you narrow down in what ways will you work more on partnerships? Because at the moment, it looks like we're getting into round two of the Cold War. And also, if you could please comment about um, the Arctic area and your competitive strategies there. Thank you. So the questions are on, on allies and who are, the, who are, who are our allies. And, and certainly the NDS does focus on allies and partnership and, and, and um, creating new um, networks. So I, um, and the other question, the second question was on the Arctic and what, that, um, what kind of um, impact that has on the NDS and our national security. So I, I'll, I'll put it. Go ahead. Jamie, Just on the, I'll, I'll defer the Arctic. I think it's a cold place. Um, <laughs> no experience, no judgment there. Uh, so give me a pass on that. But the first question is a very good question. What's different from the Cold War and alliances partnerships? Well, if you look at Eastern Europe's you know, framework right now, we were not partners with the, the Baltic states. We are right now. We have forces and multinational mm -hmm. battle groups on the ground, interagency development on the ground in places we've never been, expanding uh, the reach and the international order to places uh, post-Cold War, 1991. That's one aspect. Two, I would look at Africa and the nations in Africa as a, a developing opportunity that has been growing for and emerging for years. China is in that space right now. The United States and other allies are in that space. It's going to be a competitive space, but it can be a jointly competitive space, increasing those new allies and partnerships in that area. The third one I'll mention is a, as a specific country example, and I'll defer to my maritime friends, is, is Vietnam. My father spent two years fighting in that country, in Laos and Cambodia as well. Um, we are now an effective partner with that nation in many ways. We're talking about multi-basing opportunities in that region. Who would have thought of that 30, 40 years ago? 
So those are new and emerging opportunities for increasing capacity and alliances and partnerships. The United States will never go it alone to help support the international order from Bretton Woods into today. The United States will continue to need allies and partners in new and creative ways. Great, thank you. So I will also say I'll shift the Arctic because uh, <laughs> all I know is it's uh, very cold and we are taking a look at it definitely within the Air Force too, but uh, that is in the uh, initial stages. But as, in regards to the alliances and the partners, I, I don't say that it's a shift. I would say that it's a strengthen. And how can we strengthen those that we are working with and expand even more uh, so that we have a webbed, or webbed uh, alliance for uh, every part of the region? Things I'm thinking about specifically is, uh, you know, the Afghans are flying the A-29. What we're about to do in our light attack aircraft is accomplish another experiment. And in that experiment, uh, we're not only looking at what we need so that we can have a lower cost capability to do close air support, but to bring it into a price point where we can have allies and partners involved being able to afford those kind of aircraft versus our fifth gen aircraft or special or our stealth aircraft and being able to help our overall uh, um, efforts in trying to get violent extremism uh, controlled. So all of those opportunities that we're raising to bring the uh, allies and partners in, it's giving some of those capabilities that we maybe didn't start from the beginning. We generated something and then we looked out there and said, where is a foreign mili military sales opportunity? We're bringing them in from the initial stages, uh, which I think is very huge in communicating how important it is for our, us to have our allies and partners, because as alluded to, we do not at all want to go at anything alone, and we want to have our allies and the partners working with us, having the same picture as us, as we are potentially, if we're led down that ro route, uh, on the battlefield. So Coast Guard has been banging the Arctic drum for over 10 years, so it's finally... <laughs> You know, finally the issue showed up in the news, so we're really excited. Um, I think it's a really, it's a timely question. It actually came up a lot, not only during the Coast Guard Commandant's confirmation hearing, but both PACOM and NORTHCOM got asked questions about what we're doing to sort of meet one of our major strategic competitors um, in the Arctic. Uh, the United States has one operational heavy icebreaker. Russia has six, two of which are nuclear powered. So we're obviously behind, really, in capacity there. Uh, but when we look at the Arctic uh, from the Coast Guard's perspective, uh, there's really a whole spectrum. On the very high end, there is the NDS component of being able to operate as an armed service there. But before you get to that point, there is just human activity, economic opportunity there that we want to protect. So as the Coast Guard, um, we are the United States representative to the Arctic Council, which uh, all of the Arctic nations. Uh, as well as China. China is an observer member now. Um, participate in to try to keep the Arctic um, as open as possible for for human development and activity in a way that's consistent with international norms. Um, so, in addition to just icebreakers, what we've really looked at is infrastructure in the Arctic, being able to base and operate out of there in the summer months as the ice retreats. That's really where you see the opportunities for human activity. It's actually the most dangerous time of year because the water isn't completely open and it isn't completely frozen. Um, but doing all of this really takes partners. And when we look at places for our partners to engage and to do some of that burden sharing, the Arctic actually seems like a great place for that to happen because there is so much expertise in our allied nations, particularly Norway, things like that. So. Um, as far as our national strategy, it's definitely to move in concert with our, with our Arctic allies uh, and to look at the whole spectrum of activity, not just defense. So. Thank you. So, I have a question. Uh, 
Uh, hi, my name is Dimitri. Thank you very much. I'm wondering if you could talk about the uh, fiscal aspects of this. Of the, uh, uh, I know uh, defense is extremely important, but we're running huge budget deficits, and financial can be a national security threat as well. So I'm wondering how much, uh, what is being done within DOD to make sure the money is used efficiently and uh, burden sharing. Maybe we can pass off some of our responsibility and share them with other people. Thank you. Sorry. I'll take a stab at this uh, initially in the realms of we're going through an audit. And uh, as we go through that audit, the first time we've done it for at least as long as I have ever heard, uh, we are assuring that we are understanding exactly where each one of those dollars are going. And we're not going to get it right the first time, and it's going to take a couple years to make sure that, that uh, we can tell that whole story. But ultimately, when we get those dollars, and we are a little bit challenged as we go through sequestration and continued resolutions where we get it all when we only have a half a year left or whatnot, uh, we have the plans, and we know where we need to modernize, and we know uh, what programs that we need to push forward and installations that we need to uh, work on. And then as we look at places that maybe we don't need as much anymore, we're working with outside agencies to be able to utilize those facilities uh, so that they're not sitting dormant uh, and just eating up a bunch of money. So we're looking across the board. Now it's very tough to get specific on each individual uh, program and say whether it uh, is completely efficient or not. But as you've uh, seen, as, as we did go through sequestration, that uh, we didn't have parts available. We, didn't, uh, we weren't able to keep the manning uh, efficient, and that has caused uh, a lot of backlog in things and depots to keep our aircraft uh, available at the rates that we need them. Uh, so we are definitely uh, being asked to look at it more aggressively, and as you know, uh, the DepSec Def is uh, CEO by trade. So he's put that extra challenge inside of the Department of Defense to assure that he can understand the books, um, a perspective that we maybe not have not always had, and he will help us in assuring that we're able to tell that story. I can piggyback on that. That's a very good question. And my secretary would tell us, everybody, that we have an obligation to use the taxpayers' dollars wisely, A. That's a moral obligation. But specific, let me give you some examples of what we're trying to do. The Secretary is already looking at all the research labs that we have. We have numerous research labs that work in the billions for research development, science, technology investments, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. A lot of overlapping work going on there. So consolidating, streamlining that. Working with industry that invests heavily um, into science and technology, leaning on that rather than duplicate efforts inside the department. We're already doing that. Um, Three, don't need any more help. Congress has already given us authorities to modernize acquisition management and reform. So the Army's moving out, creating an Army's Futures Command, which will potentially be a new four-star command that's going to streamline the requirements through production uh, and the acquisition process, saving billions. It's going to take seven to ten years off the acquisition for major programs. That's a huge deal. That is managing money and investments wisely. Uh, and Dr. Esper is really on, on the warpath to try to support that. We're in that process right now. The last thing I'll leave you with is the biggest threat, not original thought here, just echoing it from the DOD's leadership, the biggest threat to all of this is, is unpredictable funding. The time value of money and being able to invest in those things and major development programs, we, every time we have a continuing resolution, every time we don't have a predictable budget, we end up wasting taxpayer dollars, flat out. That is a problem. Well. We have two questions here, um, gentlemen in the front and then in the middle. I'm Joe Craig from Association of the United States Army. Uh, Colonel Val, you mentioned multi-domain battle, and in many of the domains it's clear, you know, who's going to be primarily addressing the challenges. So Coast Guard and the Navy is going to take care of the maritime by building a bigger and stronger fleet. The Air Force is taking care of the skies with programs like the F-35. On land, the cross-functional teams addressing soldier lethality or long-range fires. But who's taking care of cyber? Whether it's uh, you know, hacking attacks on the electrical grid, 
or social media enge engineering like uh, the Baltic story you told? Who, who's going to take the lead there? Okay, and then we'll take the question from the gentleman in the front. Yeah. Um, is global warming also prohibited term in the Coast Guard? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm... Is global warming also a prohibited term in the U.S. Coast Guard? <laughs> so we have two questions on cyber, um, what's going on with cyber, and then we'll take one final question in the, so on the other side. Thanks. Let's say, for example, that when Brookings did or is doing its budget scrub this year, that it discovers an extra billion dollars. Where would each of you recommend to your service that they spend that? And don't tell me five things. Tell me the one thing that you would recommend spending that extra billion dollars on, people. So these are all one phrase answers. So, um, so we have a question on cyber, who's taking care of cyber, um, on climate change. Um, and if you had one thing that you would spend a billion dollars on, um, what would it be? Um, so I'll leave those questions to you, and then and you can pick and choose as you please. People that buy 7,500 extra people and develop soldiers and capabilities that fills gaps in our operational force uh, easily. For your question, that's a very good one. So there's a philosophical discussion that's been going on for years about space and cyber domains and who owns it. And there's some camps that think that space should be its own service. Cyber, its own service. That may be the future. Right now, I think every department, interagency Departments as well have their own cyber capabilities depending on what they are. There's offensive, defensive, and intrusion capabilities, but without going to specifics, everybody here on the panel and all the services you represent have equities in those domains. Um, I couldn't give you an opinion on should the Army own cyber or should the Navy own the space domain versus the Air Force. The, uh, those are going to be evolutionary as we develop the operational concepts for multi-domain and where that goes. I, I think that the more we create a executive agent versus a proponent with specific service function is probably the right answer. That's my opinion. Uh, we have executive agency for different functions right now. Uh, there's, I think there's 75 plus executive agencies that uh, the military departments have. Um, but that's a, that's a tough one. Who would own the domain? I'm not sure anybody needs to. I think the department owns it. So I'll start with the cyber piece too. The cyber mission force uh, that exists out there to be utilized by the combatant commanders are populated by every service. Um, so any one service that might end up being an executive agent uh, at the end um, will still have a population of all the, the services. They are not gonna get out of that business. Um, in regards to the uh, $1 billion, I also agree with people, but taking a little bit of spin on that is uh, we've already planned to increase our end strength uh, by 4,300 this year and 3,000 over the next few years uh, through the FIDEP, is that the IT systems that we have are antiquated, unable to, as Dan alluded to, uh, give us the adequate uh, measures for our people, providing the feedback, uh, constructive feedback, expeditiously, real time. Uh, you know, companies out there would have someone back in the back room ready to type. So as soon as I sit down, I already have feedback on what I spoke about and how I didn't adequately speak about something or how I misspoke about something. Uh, and that's feedback that the millennials are looking at. Ad additionally, to manage talent and to assure they have choice, uh, and options, you have to have an IT system that allows, given the amount of people we have, to have an input, the, the pr provider or the person who, or that owns the position that needs filled, provide what they need, do some gonculation to assure that we can get most people to one of their top five choices, uh, and the people get to vote on which ones they would prefer before that gonculation happens. Uh, we are going through that process right now and putting a, uh, some money. I think if we put a lot more money, we would get to the point of people wouldn't be so glass half empty 
and become more glass half full because they don't have to worry about that piece because they know they're being taken care of. The system builds the art, or sorry, the science, and then we can have our limited amount of personnel, HR people, actually work on the art around the edges so that more people are happy uh, given the inputs from them and their families. Okay, great. So for the, the cyber piece, you know, you've kind of tapped into one of the big questions, which is what is the line between Homeland Security and defense? You know, ensuring the safety of the power grid, which is largely privately owned, um, falls largely under Homeland Security. And that's a, an interagency public-private partnership that continues to evolve. Uh, so it's, you know, in football, it's always offense or defense. Cyber is more like soccer. All the players are on the field at the same time. Um, and so there is really no single department or agency that owns all of cyber, at least right now. Uh, but we do all have a big part of that. As far as a billion dollars for the Coast Guard, you know, we have a $10 billion budget. So that would be a pretty big deal. <laughs> um, I think fundamentally we all want to invest in our people, but um, the IT and C4 IT, really command and control for the Coast Guard, is something that we could definitely spend a billion dollars on to ensure our interoperability with our DOD partners and also just to better support our mission and to, to empower our already too small workforce to get all the things done that we're asking them to do. And to answer your question, I think uh, unmanned systems, AI, and autonomy. That's where that billion dollars should go. And to those other questions, I think they've amply answered them, and we're out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists um, for, your, for the stimulating discussion and for you, the audience, for engaging um, with us um, today. So thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.